Welcome to Fruity Knitting. I'm Madeline. And I'm Andrea. And this is episode 137. For new viewers, Fruity Knitting is a 90-minute program that brings you knitting inspiration from around the world, as well as some extra snippets of travel, history, and storytelling that we hope adds joy to your life and brings a smile to your face. And in today's episode, we're including two interviews we filmed back in April during the Swiss Yarn Festival. They're on entirely different subjects, but they're equally fascinating. So our feature interview is with the Italian designer Dario Tubiana, who's an embroiderer extraordinaire. In the knitting world, Dario is known for his intricate use of embroidery on hand-knitted garments, and he has an awe-inspiring portfolio of really unique and exciting designs. So during our interview, Dario simplifies embroidery, making it much easier to understand and get the hang of, and he gives valuable tips on how to combine embroidery with knitting. And Dario also likes to use intarsia and embroidery together because that way he can use more color and create really stunning and intricate pictures. He worked as a professor at the European Institute of Design in Milan, where he was teaching hand knitting and embroidery techniques to design students. So Dario is really practicing his craft at a very high level, and some of his designs just look like works of art, so I think you're going to love it. They're a lot of fun. And then we have a mini interview with Maya Siska on Icelandic wool and women. Now Maya came to the Swiss Yarn Festival to lecture on the topic, which I found fascinating, and during the interview, Maya shares two stories. Now the first story introduces you to the historical and cultural importance of sheep farming on Iceland, going back to the first Viking settlers, and the second is a more personal story of how two groups of women on either side of the southern glacial river in Iceland are working to revive the Icelandic wool industry and to ensure that the knowledge about wool quality and the fibre handcrafts doesn't get lost. Also, Iceland now has a Wool Week, which happens biannually, with the next one being held in 2024. So Maya gives a good overview of what the Iceland Wool Week offers, and I'm hoping we might go there next year <laughs> to cover the festival. That would be a lot of fun. That would. And then in Under Construction, we have two new projects to show you, and in Bring and Brag, we have two finished projects, including a fashion show. So we'll get straight into Bring and Brag. With me. So in Germany, the weather has really changed now. It's a lot colder, so I'm able to wear my finished jumper to show it off to you. But the mohair content in this jumper makes it so warm. It's really a jumper to wear in minus degree temperatures. So hopefully I can keep it on for the whole episode. This is a mashup of two Kim Hargrave designs. So here are the two designs that I combined together. The one on the left is called Charge, and the one on the right is named Parker. They knit up to the same gauge of 22 stitches and 30 rows to 10 centimetres squared, and they use the same recommended yarn, which is the Rowan Alpaca Soft DK. So this made it very easy for me to take the elements that I liked best from both designs and combine them together, because I preferred the ribbing on charge better than the ribbing on Parker. And even though you can't see it clearly, the dimensions of charge are smaller than the dimensions of Parker for the same size. And I wanted a tighter fit, so I worked out how to fit the cable design of Parker into the bust circumference of charge. So that's why it's a mashup of two designs. And in the previous episode, I talked in detail about how I made all of those modifications, so I won't repeat it today. But I've had a troubled relationship with this sweater. I've gone through stages of really loving it and anticipating with great excitement about how fantastic it's going to look and then finding problems with it that I hadn't thought of earlier. One of the things is that I'm going through a stage now of wanting all my jumpers to be cropped or short in the waist so that I can wear them with a skirt, particularly like a full skirt. But then when I try them on with my jeans, they're not quite long enough to cover the waistband of my jeans, which is never sitting directly in my waist, but always say around five mm. centimeters lower than the belly button. So yeah. it's really hard to find that Goldilocks fit of, of making a jump, uh, jumper look brilliant with a skirt and with jeans. Yeah, I don't like the look when it doesn't cover the top part of the jeans. I think yeah. it looks a bit funny because you can see the top underneath just peek out. Yeah. And if you don't have the right color underneath, it looks even worse. Yeah, if you have to wear it, yeah, showing yeah. what you're wearing underneath your jumper. But since finishing knitting this, I have blocked it and given it an extra about, say, four centimeters. But I think that the this yarn is going to have quite a lot of memory and that over time it might sort of just shrink back into 
into its original size, which is a bit of a shame. The other thing is that I had some trouble trying to get this neck to look right. And I've re-knitted this neck at least three times. I think I've got a bit of a thin neck and I was just worried about making the neck too wide. So I really overcompensated. So first I reduced the stitch count and I knitted the neck on a much smaller size needle. But then when I tried the neck on, it choked me, almost choked me. So I ripped it I out. Think it was that dramatic. <laughs> it was pretty dramatic. It was surprising. And then I knitted it again on a size larger needle, but it was still too tight. So I ripped it out a second time. And then I increased the stitch count by about eight stitches, which is about three to four centimeters in width. And I knitted it a third time and it worked better that time, but then I couldn't decide, do I want to have a long single layered turtleneck or do I want to knit it extra long and turn it over and have a double layered turtleneck? All these decisions I couldn't decide. So I took some photos, actually you took the photos yes. to help me decide. And I was extremely helpful. <laughs> you were patient with me. So here they are so you can see my process. So in this photo, the neck is just one layer, but I thought it looked too narrow because the mohair and the cables together give the jumper a bit of a bulky appearance. And I just thought that it needed a bulkier neck to balance that. So then I tried folding the neck over to make it a double layered turtleneck, but I really didn't like how that looked. After that, I turned the neck over, but on the inside, and I thought that looked better. And then finally, I made the neck longer and kept it turned inwards. And I felt that was the best choice. So after lots of umming and ahhing, I decided to go with that last option. So since finishing the jumper, I've also blocked the neck about two or three centimeters wider. So I like the neck now. I'm, I'm satisfied with it. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> So when you mess around with the design, you do run the risk of making it worse than the original. But at the same time, it's so much fun to mess around and try and change a design to the taste, your own individual taste. That to me is what I find particularly exciting about knitting. But this time I didn't quite succeed the way I imagined I would. So I think the jumper might look just slightly better, a little bit more oversized as how it is in the original. Mm. And also the ribbing that Kim used on this design is better than what I used. So she used a knit three pearl one ribbing and I used knit two pearl two. So a knit three pearl one is gonna be looser. It's not gonna pull in so much. So that would have saved me all the trouble that I had with my neck and having to block it out because I don't like relying on blocking to make my garment fit beautifully. I prefer to knit it so it's perfectly fitted and, and, not you, and only use blocking to maybe even out the stitches, but not to radically change the shape. I don't think that's a good thing because over time it does sort of shrink back to its, its natural shape. I don't think it's a problem now. As you said, as long as it doesn't shrink back and start choking you again. <laughs> um, I do think it still looks nice down the bottom. Yes. I did do a little garter stitch edging here, which makes it actually curl up a little bit because it's a little bit tighter. And if I'd done the knit three pearl one ribbing, it would sort of be looser. So this is great for skirts, but it's not so great for jeans. Okay. So it's like I said, it's hard to get that Goldilocks balance. So the other thing is I've never knitted with mohair before. This is the first time and I'm still getting used to the combination of cables and mohair because I feel a little bit like a hairy teddy bear. <laughs> But all in all, it's, a, it's always a learning experience and I am being very picky. But to end on a positive note, I absolutely love how both of these yarns knit up together because you may not be able to see it in this distance with the camera, but if you look up close or even from where you are, mm -hmm. it looks like stonewashed denim. It's really interesting texture, the mm -hmm. fabric. Yep. So what I used was the Devonia DK by John Arben Textiles in the colour moon bloom and I paired it with the navy brushed silk mohair by uh, mohair by canard this doesn't have a color name it's just the color number is 3018 in case you're interested so I I'm really happy the way those, those two work together so there you go that's me done with my finished jumper 
And now it's up to you. <laughs> yes, it's up to me. Although I do want to give my two cents. I love this colour in combination together, the denim washed blue, but I still am hoping that you'll maybe buy some more of this colour and make another jumper with just this one because I do think that this particular shade is really beautiful. It's quite special. It is. And it doesn't quite come to fruition when you combine it with something else. That is kind of true because this is a heathered yarn and there's lots of fine colours in this. So you're missing out on that yeah. when you put the mohair together. But yeah. it was an interesting experience to do mohair yes. together. And I don't think you're quite the hairy, fluffy, <laughs> fluffy teddy bear anymore as you were when it wasn't blocked. <laughs> so true. But I'm, I'm nice to cuddle. Yeah, you're very nice to cuddle. Yeah. Anyway, okay. it's my turn now. Um, I finished my coffee socks by Charlotte Stone. And this pattern is from her book, Charming Colourwork Socks, and we interviewed Charlotte in episode 135, in case you haven't watched that yet. And we also have a live event coming up very soon with her. Yep. Yeah. So, um, as I've said before, this was actually my first time knitting socks, so I'm particularly happy that they've worked out so well, if I might say. Um, they fit me beautifully. Luckily, because I didn't block them properly, well, I didn't sw swatch for them properly. And also the coffee cups are just so groovy that I'm very proud to wear them and show them off in public. <laughs> yeah. Now I have talked about these socks in detail in the previous episode, so I'm only going to give a very quick summary now. Knitting these uh, socks was heaps of fun because the color changes that I made also turned out quite well. Uh, now I used the recommended yarn. Uh, these are the two oh, colors. Okay that the pattern uses. They're the Socklandia Socks Yarn by Giggling Gecko Yarns, and the colors are called Bantley Brown and Double Fudge. I also used this blue and white yarn, but they're just leftover yarns from other projects. Yeah, there's a little bit of blue here in that stripe. Yeah. You can see the original socks on the left, and my socks are on the right. To make the coffee cups stand out more, I used the white yarn for the background of the colorwork section. And I also knitted the steam in the lighter variegated yarn instead of the dark brown because I think this makes it look more steamy. So mum, I don't know if you've seen a difference in both of these socks. Yes, you haven't darned in your ends. <laughs> That's true. I, I haven't darned in my ends. Look at them. It's actually quite the mess, but I had to get these socks done as quick as possible before we filmed the fashion shoot. Yeah. Um, but I was actually talking about the colour work section. I forgot to add these little light brown dots in between oh, yeah. the steam. You haven't. How come? Oh, because I sort of memorized the pattern. I knew what it was supposed to look like, or I thought I did, and then I just did it without looking at the, the pattern. And I don't mind too much, but I do actually think the original looks better. And the other thing, the reason she's done that is so that you don't have such a long float and that you don't need to do too many floats, otherwise you lose the elasticity. Well, I was challenging myself to allow myself to do lots of floats. This is more elastic. <laughs> Never mind. They're individual. <laughs> They're beautiful all the same. They are. Anyway, I think at the moment I really want to wear these whenever I go out for coffee. I'm not sure how long that will last, but this is my new toy. Uh, we put together a little fashion show for you guys to show off both of our finished projects. Jumper and, and socks. That's right. And we filmed it at one of our local cafes in Frankfurt called Hoppenworth and Ploch. Uh, the area is really pretty. It's in the old, no, new old city of yes. Frankfurt, Neue Renovated. Altstadt. Yeah, old and part so, of the city. Yep. And I hope you enjoy it. Way down among Brazilians, coffee beans grow by the billions, so they've got to find those extra cups to fill. They've got an awful lot of coffee in Brazil. You can't get cherry soda, cause they've got to fill that quota. And the way things are, I'll bet they never will. They've got a zillion tons of coffee in Brazil. No tea. Or tomato juice, you'll see No potato juice Cause the planners down in Santa's All say no, no, no The politician's daughter Was accused of drinking water And was fined the great big $50 bill They've got an awful lot of coffee in Brazil
Mother, she smells just like a percolator. Her perfume was made right on the grill. Why they could percolate the ocean in Brazil. And when their ham and eggs need savor, coffee ketchup gives them flavor. Coffee pickles way outsell the dill. Why they put coffee in the coffee in Brazil. No tea, no tomato juice, you'll see. No potato juice. The planters down in Santa's all say no, no, no. So you add to the local color, serving coffee with a crawler. Duncan doesn't take a lot of skill. They've got an awful lot of coffee, an awful lot of coffee. Man, they got a gang of coffee in Brazil. Welcome back. I love that music. I'm so happy we found the coffee song with Frank Sinatra to accompany the fashion shoot. And it was a lot of fun filming the fashion shoot as well. Yeah, it was. Yeah. So now we're in under construction with you. Yes. So now that I've completed my coffee socks, I only have one project on the go, which is my Gladden. So I'm starting a second project. And if you've watched our more recent interview, uh, not interviews, episodes, you'll know that we traveled to Denmark in September to gather some new interviews for the show. And one of these interviews is with the mother-daughter team behind the Danish brand Knitting for Olive. So the mother, Pernilla, designs knitting patterns. And her daughter, Carolina, is in charge of marketing and sales. And together, they also develop their own yarn ranges to go with Pernilla's designs. So you'll have the opportunity to watch this interview in a future episode. Um, we filmed the interview in their shop in Copenhagen. Stunning so shop. It is a beautiful shop. Copenhagen is stunning. Um, so afterwards, we took the opportunity to browse through their various yarns, which come in so many colors. Hundreds of colors for each. I think there's about 80 colors for each shade. So 80 of red and 80 of blue. It's yeah. amazing. Yeah. Well, you'll get to see more of that in the interview. But we've brought some home with us. And we also got their book, which I have here. The book has 20 different patterns in it. And I really like the Barbro blouse. This has recently come out in English. The Barbro blouse is a fitted long sleeve top with a short turtleneck and set in sleeves. It's covered in a delicate lace pattern shaped like scallops. And a special feature of this blouse is definitely the eyelet opening at the back. Three small buttons hold it together. I love this feature and I really like the buttons they chose for this picture. They look like shimmering shells and I think together with a scallop lace pattern they give the top an oceanic theme. Now in their shop in Copenhagen, Pernilla and Carolina have samples of all their designs knitted up so we both got to try lots of designs on and this particular design looks really good on. It does. I don't think I have anything knitted that looks so elegant and it could even be worn as evening wear so I'm really excited to get started on this project. I don't have anything so elegant either that's knitted up. <laughs> I fell in love with it and I also got some yarn for the same design so maybe we'll knit them both together, I don't know. I hope it's not going to turn into a competition. <laughs> the if I do knit it at the same time then when you ask me a question I won't have to go and read the pattern I'll know exactly what you're talking about yeah but at the same time I've got other things I've got that I'm more excited about knitting up first but, yeah so this is the yarn that I'm going to use yes anyway matching the oceanic theme I'm using the recommended merino yarn in the color dusty sea green I wanted a color that would go with most of my wardrobe so it had to be fairly neutral but I don't look good in classic neutral colors like beige or gray. Um, now this color does have gray in it, but essentially it's still green and it does match my eye color. So I think it'll suit my complexion. It matches your eyes perfectly. Yeah. I think it's gonna, <laughs> it's gonna look stunning. Thank you. It's gonna look really great. <laughs> yes, I hope so. Now you start this top by knitting the body bottom up and in the round until you reach the armholes. Then you divide the body into the front and the back and knit these separately. And after that you work the sleeves and sew them onto the body. I haven't started knitting so I don't have anything to show yet, but because the top is knitted bottom up I've already had to think about how long I want the top to be. And I think that in winter there's nothing worse than having a top that's too short because then you have cold air coming underneath. Yeah. Um, I want to ensure this doesn't happen to me because I get cold really quickly. So the original design is actually cropped. 
which means I will need to lengthen the body by adding an extra pattern repeat or two, and I hope this works out the way I want it to. Anyway, I think this is a great design and I'm really excited about starting it. Yes, it's going to be really beautiful. So coming up now is our interview on Icelandic wool and women with Maya Siska and Madeline. I'm with Maya and she has come all the way from Iceland to hold a lecture called Icelandic Wool and Women here at the Swiss Yarn Festival. The lecture tells two stories. The first story introduces you to the historical and cultural importance of sheep farming in Iceland, and after that comes a more personal story of how two groups of local Icelandic women have worked to revive the local wool industry and keep Icelandic knitting traditions alive. So how important has sheep farming been in Iceland, both historically and culturally? Well, the, Iceland, uh, the Vikings settled Iceland about 1,000 years ago, and without sheep farming, it wouldn't have been possible to inhabit the island since then uninterruptedly. Mm. So the um, sheep uh, really provided um, meat, milk, and wool, and allowed uh, people to survive on this island despite the harsh climate and the short summers. And um, uh, the... Um, Icelandic sheep uh, still today is a very important part of, of the of the culture. Mm -hmm. uh, the breed, uh, the Icelandic sheep that we have in Iceland now are direct descendants of the Viking sheep, and uh, they uh, um, are a primitive breed, so-called primitive breed, which just means that they haven't really developed much or been altered much over the centuries. And uh, they belong to a group of uh, sheep breeds that are called the North Atlantic Short tail mm -hmm. sheep and uh, that means they are related to the seaweed eating Ronaldsay, the Heidschnucke, the Finn sheep and uh, and other breeds uh, there's a big group of them mm -hmm. and uh, most of these breeds um, they will shed their coat but if you want usable wool you really need to uh, share them once or twice a year which okay, is the case yeah. with the Icelandics and they have a dual coat, which uh, consists of uh, uh, talk and tail. And I have just sort of a lock of wool here for mm -hmm. you. And uh, I'm going to just pull it apart. And you can see that it divides into two different um, fibers, really. So here you have the uh, very warm and fluffy undercoat, mm -hmm. uh, which makes a very nice uh, woolen yarn. And here you have the long outer coat that we call talk, and uh, that was uh, the insulating layer, and this layer was to make the water run off the sheep. Okay, so the is this talk, and that's tail, isn't it? Tail, yes. Tail, okay. Yes, yeah. And this one protects you from rain and snow, and yes. uh, that's the warm, uh, yes, the the warm, warm part of the fleece. <laughs> yes, yes. And do they get let out onto the highlands at all? Yes, they still today, um, still today in many areas in Iceland, they release the sheep for the summer grazing up in the highlands, mm -hmm. which is very sparsely, you know, the vegetation is very sparse there, and they come back fat and healthy and beautiful looking. So, yeah. Yes. So what was the knitting culture like? Maybe, I think there was a change before and after the World yes. War II. Yes, that's right. Um, before World War II, we can really say that Iceland did not have an urban culture and everybody lived in the countryside and uh, and produced everything they needed themselves. Mm -hmm. And uh, they were always working from the wool. They were made knitted and woven items and all extra items that were needed at home were used as a, as a bargain basically to trade for sugar and coffee and other imports. Mm -hmm. And that also means that uh, in the long uh, evenings and especially the very long winters, every man, woman and child would be knitting. 
and working with wool. Yeah. And uh, and then, of course, that changed, not just in Iceland, but uh, around the world. And um, around World War II and, and after World War II, in Reykjavik, suddenly services were needed and wages were paid. And also there were imports of synthetic materials and other clothes. And it became just very unfashionable and a little bit poor looking if mm. you were wearing handmade item. So it was really the fashion to just buy something for money. How sad. <laughs> yes. And and so Iceland, just like the rest of the world, saw the wool prices drop. Yeah. And, uh, and that meant that wool then became a side product. And the farmers... Uh, concentrated on meat production and uh, and sort of uh, you know forgot a little bit about wool and and also the knowledge about wool quality mm. got lost and um, and still today some farmers will uh, just let the wool compost out in nature because they um, it doesn't pay to drive them to the next collection point yeah. yeah so who are these two groups of Icelandic women and what efforts are they making to revive the Icelandic wool industry Yes, there's two gr groups of women uh, that are working with wool, and I'm uh, in both groups. And one is on the west of a glacier river, and the other one on the east of a glacier river. And that might sound strange to you, but in Iceland, the glacier rivers have always segmented the country into parts, and uh, to because they were difficult to cross. Now today we maybe have one main bridge across the river, but still there is these segments, and and everybody sort of operates in the area. And uh, the first group west of the river is called Thinkbok, and it's a corporation that was uh, founded 33 years ago by two women with a textile and design background. And they were very concerned that the knowledge about wool quality was getting lost, and also the knowledge about quality craftsmanship with wool. And uh, from the beginning, the Thinkbook women would always go once a year to the collecting point for all the wool in Iceland, and they would sort through the wool and find the best quality wool to then have processed by our big mill, Eastex. And uh, and we having we're having made uh, a lot of plötelope, mm -hmm. which is an unspun uh, roving, and uh, you can see it knit up here. And these are the natural colors. And uh, they are also washing it less for us, so it contains some of the lanolin. There's a little bit of sheep smell in it still, which we find charming. We love it. I do too. <laughs> and, and, uh, and we also have two ply made and one ply. And uh, of course, uh, knitting sort of comes and goes out of fashion. So in the year 2000, for example, there was only one woman that went to the collecting uh, place and wool collecting place and sorted through the wool. And uh, luckily for us all now today, she kept it alive because the cope is stronger than ever. And there's 15 very active members and about 60 people that are knitting sweaters and other uh, quality items for the co-op shop. And I think one reason for the popularity is also that uh, we are having a few of the women are hand dyeing in small batches the plötelope. And we also actually have a dyer that does a plant dyeing, but I didn't bring a sample for you. Mm -hmm. But these are these spectacular samples. And uh, you can see that the uh, here it's knit up one natural color, one hand dyed mm -hmm. color. And you can also see in the sweater that the natural color and the hand dyed colors can work just really great together. Mm. But that, of course, also means that the popularity of the wool and everything means that now when we go and sort through the wool, we need at least 12 women and we need three days, which we're not complaining about. We're, we really enjoy it. So this last January, we went and we sorted through about 10 tons of wool and we found 2.2 tons of really fantastic lamb's wool and we uh, came home with white gray or we didn't bring it home yet but white gray brown and black yeah and uh, and so we are looking for high quality lamb's wool but also for the rich natural colors and how do you teach the newcomers, uh, the new members mm. who come and, and want to learn how to look for the high quality wool as well? Yes, we it's 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 quite uh, easy. We are, are standing at big sorting tables, and uh, and we just always uh, have some newcomers and some experienced people, and then it's very much learning by doing, and and you get a feel for it. Mm. After a while, I I tend to use my fingers more than my eyes when I sort through wool. Okay. And yeah, and then of course at the end of it we have a big party and uh, have cocktails and leg of lamb with yeah. So 
<laughs> yeah. Yes. So what about the spinning sisters? Yeah, the spinning sisters, uh, I live east of the river and this, that's where the spinning sisters are. And uh, in 2012, there was four or five women that went and learned hand spinning at the co-op. And uh, then they decided to just meet once a week and keep the spinning up and, and get better spinners. And as the word got round, more and more women came to these spin meetings and learned spinning from the other spinning sisters. And today there's 15 very active members and spinning sisters. And uh, we still meet regularly and, and work together. Mm -hmm. And I think some of you have started your own um, businesses even. That's right. There's a few yeah. that have small businesses, but I think the best example is Hulda, who in 2017 opened up her, the first mini mill of Iceland oh, great. called Uppsbøne. Yeah. And she now makes yarn on the farm from her own sheep's wool. And it is also the first time in Iceland that it's possible for farmers or sheep holders uh, breeders to go with a small amount of wool and have it processed into yarn and then the yarn basically has the name of the sheep on it. Because many yeah. of your members also have their own sheep farms, is that yes, correct? Yes, yeah. we're sheep, yeah. uh, a lot of us are sheep farmers and, and, yeah. and live, off the la or live on the land. Yes. Yeah. And you were telling me earlier that you emphasize creating a whole lot of different items. Um, you even said that you're using some Viking technique to create yes. dog leashes. And, yeah, yeah, and yeah that's rings. right. Yeah. You it's brought called, some here. Yeah, it, it's, uh, it's called tablet weaving. And uh, we learned tablet weaving a few years ago from teachers uh, from a teacher in Germany. And uh, we have often gotten teachers from all over the world to teach us crafts. Mm -hmm. And then we find a way to make something and, and create a product. And we're all uh, riders, or most of us have horses. So the first thing that we come up with is reins, but we also do dog leashes. Yeah. And we also have a felting table. And so some of the spinning sisters make these beautiful um, seats. And we also make saddle blankets, of mm -hmm. course. And uh, and here is also a good example for just the beauty of the natural wool and the structure of the wool. Mm. And I don't know which is the back or the, the front side, but I show you both sides just to show you the design of it. Both of them are gorgeous. And these mm. are all the natural shades, yeah? Yes. And so how do you guys cooperate together? I think you travel? Yes, we also travel a lot. Um, we have been, or a lot, you know, we have been, we think it's fantastic. We have been to uh, Shetland Wool Week in 2017. And uh, in 2019, there was 30 of us from both groups together. Uh, to travel to America to the Rhinebeck Sheep and Wool Festival. That sounds like so much fun. Yes. I think um, it must have been quite the sight on the plane, <laughs> all these niches <laughs> next to each other in the aisles. Yes. That's great. Yeah. yeah. But you're not uh, – do you um, – intentionally uh, call yourself the sisters or do you also have men in your groups no it's it, it is a bit like you know women and wool like the mm. the lecture but uh, it is not intentional it just seems to be men are welcome and sometimes there will be the odd you know spinner uh, male yeah. spinner yeah. but uh, uh, it seems that uh, women are more interested in wool and wool crafts mm -hmm. and so it just happens that we're all women and uh, it makes for great sisterhood and mm. uh, it is a very valuable social network for yeah, us. That yeah. does sound lovely. So this close collaboration between the two groups did eventually lead to the South Iceland Wool Week. Mm -hmm. The festival is organized biannually and will be held again next year in the first week of October. So what will be some of the highlights? Yes, uh, we will be holding Wool Week uh, next uh, from the 30th of September to the 6th of October in 2024. And the date is always, uh, um, we time it so that we have a very special sheep show as part of our program. It's called uh, Leta Sining, which means uh, color show. And about 10 years ago, some farmers in the area, they uh, wanted to create an incentive for people to breed the beautiful colors that the Icelandic sheep has. And they were concerned about the genetics being lost. And the reason for that is that commercially, um, a sheep fleece that is speckled or has more than one color is not worth anything because mm. you cannot make a consistent yarn color from it. And so most sheep today, even in Iceland, that you see will be white. But we have a huge amount of different colors. And so now with the with the later scening, the sheep show, um, there is a possibility if you manage to breed a particularly beautiful or strange looking or rare color, you can go with your sheep to the uh, sheep show. Uh, the price is a homemade cake on mm -hmm. the long table. And, uh, and you can take part in the judging. And with a bit of luck, you can win a prize over your neighbor's sheep. 
and there's a lot of competition there, very friendly, comp but competition still. That sounds fun. Yeah, so it's a great event, and we're sort of integrating that in our Wuri program. Um, another thing is that, for example, your Hulda, our spinning sister with the mini mill, she will open up her sheep stable and you can go in and meet the sheep one on one and you can pick a fleece and uh, you can watch it being shorn. The shearers will be there as well. And then you can take your fleece and walk it over to the mini mill and order your yarn being made from the same fleece. That's really special. Mm. Yeah. And uh, the Thinkbook women, they are always uh, running a knitting cafe, which is a brilliant place to go. It's a really nice atmosphere. There's always lots of people and you can just talk to other knitters and crafters or even just stop by between lectures and workshops that will also be on offer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, the uh, Spinning Sisters, they will open up their studios and they live on farms sort of around the area. So it's a great experience to just drive around and see the beautiful landscape, maybe catch a glimpse of Volcano Hecla, which is our home volcano, and uh, and see the different farms and, and, and get to sort of get to know yeah. people. Yeah, yeah. And uh, on the Saturday always of Woolwick, we have a maker's market, and that is all, uh, I think, predominantly um, Icelandic makers that uh, that come to the market, and it's right next to the to the um, knitting, knitting cafe. cafe yeah. Yes, yeah. so that's uh, that's also brilliant. Yeah, mm. well, that sounds like a great program, and also a great opportunity to get to know some of the locals because it's very community involved. It is. Isn't yes, it? Yeah. it is. Yes, I'm hoping that we'll be visiting the um, South Iceland Wool Week ourselves. <laughs> Uh, because mum loves Iceland. Thank you so much for coming on Fruity Knitting. Thank you very much, and I uh, would love to see you there. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome back. We hope you enjoyed learning more about wool and the fiber crafts in Iceland and maybe you'll be interested in attending their wool week next year. Our primary goal with these interviews is always to make them as content rich as possible so that hopefully by the end you've been inspired and learnt something new. But this doesn't happen unless we do extensive research and preparation beforehand and then we carry various travel costs to film the actual interview. Now we love doing this work and based on the comments and the messages we receive, many of you enjoy the content we produce. So if you want to help us continue to produce quality content, you can do so by becoming a Fruity Knitting patron. As a patron, you make a small monthly contribution starting at five US dollars a month. And we prefer this model to receiving one-off donations because it means that we have a more steady and a reliable income instead of having to worry too much about our income dramatically fluctuating from one month to the next. So please do become a patron. And thank you to all the viewers who have become patrons and have financially supported the show over the years, because without your financial support, this show really could never exist. So thank you very much. So we'll continue now in under construction with my newest project. I'm really excited to be to knitting a design by our feature interview guest, Dario Tubiana. So as I mentioned earlier, <sighs> earlier, <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting into the Italian accent. Dario Tubiana, as I mentioned earlier. <laughs> I have to add an, a vowel on the end of every word. <laughs> okay. What did you mention earlier, Mum? As I mentioned earlier, <laughs> Dario is um, known for his intricate embroidery designs, but he's also a great fan of intarsia and using bright, vibrant colours. So the design I'm knitting is a vest called Blue Lagoon Flowers. So here's a picture of the design. I think it's really striking. I love the bold retro flowers and also the color combination that Dario's used in the flowers. So you can see the front and back of the vest here and you knit the vest in pieces and then you seam the front and back together with side seams. It's worked flat in pieces because it's much easier to knit intarsia flat than in the round. And for new knitters, intarsia is the technique that's used for the flowers. It's a great technique to use when you have blocks of different colours. But I'm considering knitting the back of the vest in plain blue with no flowers. Now the form of the vest is very much unisex, 
but I want to put in some waist shaping. But by doing this, I would lose around four stitches on the left petal of the bottom flower, which is a bit of a shame. So what I'm doing is bringing the whole lower flower motif across to the right by four stitches. And I'm also bringing the flower motif down two rows. And I'm doing that to make sure that there's gonna be a big enough gap between the green leaf of the bottom flower and the green leaf of the top flower. So hopefully that'll still work and I'll be able to have my waist shaping without destroying the flower motif or the balance of how the flowers are placed on the vest. So I have done that. I have put the waist shaping in. It's in stocking stitch so the sides are curling in. You can't quite see it, but I think I will manage to do that. And these two leaves are quite close together, but hopefully it'll still look balanced. So as I said, the design is using intarsia for the blocks of colours, but it also uses duplicate stitch. And for new knitters, duplicate stitch is a form of embroidery. So when you've finished your knitting, you get a tapestry or you use a tapestry needle with a contrast coloured yarn and you duplicate the shape of the knitted stitches over the original knitting. So it's normally done or typically done over stocking stitch and the new coloured stitches will look like they're part of the original knitting. So it's a really easy way of adding extra colour to your knitting. So, But you wouldn't want to do that for two larger sections, would you? No, because it is adding a double layer. Yeah, it might make it too heavy. Yeah, yeah. but yeah. you can't. what you can do is um, you can add little pictures to your knitting. So maybe mm. you want to do a little heart or a bird or a flower, or you can write words with duplicate stitch. Okay. Or if you're doing a lot of fair isle and you don't like one little colour because maybe it's not contrasting enough or standing out, just for that colour you can duplicate stitch a new colour in and that means you don't have to undo all of your knitting and re-knit it. That might be an easy way to do one of those Ronald Weasley Harry Potter jumpers. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> but that's also what you could do here. You could duplicate stitch oh, the little bits the of extra. Missing, yeah. missing steam. Yeah. 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 So was... it's a great technique to learn. So going back to the design, the shading in the flower petals of both flowers and the black outline and the centre of the flowers are all done in duplicate stitches. And if you haven't done a lot of intarsia before, doing some of the colour work with duplicate stitch is just a more straightforward or user-friendly solution. So I'm trying to do more intarsia and less duplicate stitch. So I'll do the shading in the flower petals with an extra little ball of colour. So you can see what I've done here. I've done these two bits of shading here in intarsia and there's two thinner bits of shading in these two petals which I'm going to do in duplicate stitch. When you've got a lot of stitches it's easier to do intarsia. That's what I think. And actually, so and I'll also do the, the black circle around this, the flower centre in, in uh, duplicate stitch. Yeah, so there you go. It's quite fun. I haven't done intarsia for a while. So that's the design. Oh, and I should just say for new knitters that for every color, every block of color with intarsia, you have to have a new ball of yarn. So that means you have end up having quite a few balls of yarn hanging off the back of your knitting. So you'd have a blue ball for here. You'd have this, um, what do you call it, salmon color here. You have another yellow ball. And then here you have a purple ball and you have two green balls. And then for this little bit here, that little bit of blue you also have another blue ball there you're not carrying this blue right behind it so that's intarsia the blue balls sound particularly <laughs> uncomfortable <laughs> okay so that's the design now i want to tell you about the yarn because it has a really interesting story behind it so the recommended yarn for this design is tibetan cloud from mayak and here are the colors that the blue lagoon vest uses can you hold some up mm -hmm. So here they all are together. This navy blue colour is darker than what comes out in the picture of the design, but I really like it because I think this is going to look really great with dark blue jeans and a white shirt. That's what I'm hoping. So it's a light DK or sports weight yarn and it's made from 100% Tibetan sheep's wool and it comes in around 22 colours altogether. Now the wool for this yarn comes from an ancient breed of Tibetan sheep that roam freely on the grasslands on the Tibetan plateau at an altitude of over 4,000 meters. I didn't know this, but the Tibetan plateau is a huge area. It's the size of Europe. 
and the Tibetan nomads shear these sheep by hand in the traditional way that's been used for centuries and they follow the natural life rhythms of the animals. Now we interviewed the founders of, of Mayak who are Paula and Andrea back in episode 56 and they're both really interesting people with very interesting backgrounds. Paula spent many years in Tibet working with non-profit groups to support the traditional nomadic lifestyle and protect their culture because the Chinese government wanted to relocate the nomads to the cities but the nomads preferred staying on the grasslands with their animals and keeping their traditional lifestyle. Andrea is a vet and he was also involved in this work with the nomads and Paula and Andrea met during their collaborative efforts with the nomads and they eventually set up their company Mayak to help increase the nomads income from their wool. So the nomads sell directly to Mayak instead of going through middlemen who take all the profits. So the interview is really fascinating and I suggest you go back and watch it if you haven't already seen it. Returning to Tibetan Cloud, this is one of Mayak's latest yarn ranges. And the wool from this yarn range is coming from a semi-desert area on the Tibetan Plateau where the nomads have a particularly low standard of living. So by using this yarn, we can help to improve their income. And the wool comes from two ancient Tibetan sheep breeds, which are also becoming very rare because they don't produce a lot of meat. And traditionally, the fleeces from these sheep breeds weren't considered to be suitable for finer purposes. They were only used to weave rugs and out, out, uh, outerwear, so outdoor clothing for, to protect the, the nomads from the weather. But now, through a meticulous selection process and a really improved de-herring process, they're able to isolate just the finest fibres, which are closer to cashmere and baby yak than to regular wool. And they're producing this incredibly soft and luxurious yarn, which I find really fascinating because it is incredibly mm, soft. You yeah. can totally wear it on your skin. You could it's put true. it on a baby. And it's amazing that you can make such a high quality, luxurious yarn from fleeces that were considered to be almost worthless. And also, I just want to say another thing, in case you're um, concerned about this or, or thinking about this, the sheep that are in this area are completely suited to that environment. They've been there for thousands of years. They uh, can survive in very harsh conditions and they can survive on very harsh, meager vegetation. And they're only nibbling at the leaves and the branches. They're not pulling the plants up from the roots. So they're not contributing to the area becoming more of a desert. And also mm -hmm. with their, their dung and their hooves, they're contributing to keeping the moisture in the soil and become, and so that it doesn't and preventing it from becoming a, a, a desert. desertation. Yeah, so sometimes there's some misinformation out there about animals and, and their impact on the environment, but these, I just wanted to, to mention that. So I'm really happy to say that Mayak is offering Fruity Knitting patrons a 15% discount of all their yarns, and they have eight different yarn ranges, including Baby Camel, a Baby Yak DK, a Baby Yak Lace, a cashmere lace and a cashmere DK and some blends like baby yak and silk and baby yak and cotton and of course the Tibetan cloud. While we're on patron discounts, our featured interview guest, Dario Tubiana, is offering Fruity Knitting patrons a 25% discount of all his self-published patterns in his Ravelry store. And Dario has collaborated with Mayak to design with their yarns. So Mayak are also offering a 15% discount of the yarn kits for the Dario Tubiana designs, which of course include the design I'm knitting called Blue Lagoon Flowers. So they're both great discounts, so thanks very much to Mayak and Dario Tubiana for these generous offers. By the way, Halloween is coming up soon, and I love it when people decorate their homes for Halloween. So I hope you've been enjoying my carved pumpkin in the background, which I did just for this episode. Late last night. So now it's time for us to say goodbye, enjoy the interview, and we'll see you again in November. Thanks for spending time with us. Bye. Bye.
welcome to Fruity Knitting. I'm with the Italian knitwear designer Dario Tubiana, who you may also know as Rosso Cardinale, which means Cardinal Red. So Dario was formerly a makeup artist and a student of Christianity and contemporary Judaism, and he's also a passionate pianist. But in the knitting world, Dario is best known for his intricate use of embroidery on knitwear, and he has a really impressive portfolio of unique and exciting designs, which he's going to share with us today. So Dario, it's just occurred to me that your background is just as colourful as your gorgeous colourful designs. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You're right. <clears throat> Actually, yeah, as you said, my background is totally different. I mean, I've, I've never uh, done anything in knitwear before um, my studies. So I graduated in uh, religious anthropology. I studied in Rome, Belgium and Israel. And after that, I got back to Italy. I started knitting again and I began, I won a scholarship for a um, graduate um, a master in creative knitwear design and so eventually that last academic adventure opened up a lot of doors you know to me in fashion and um, I began working with magazine knitting and more and creating my designs and I'm currently teaching as professor in two universities in Milan, Naba and Yed and where I teach textile design and embroidery or knitting techniques so yeah very different but eventually I ended up being a professor in that. And there's a really uh, interesting anecdote as how you came up to your name, yeah. how you came up with your name, Rosso Cardinale. So tell us that. Yeah, so I was studying at university. I was a history class, I think. And at, um, there was, the door was open and the professor was uh, asked a guy at the, uh, at the end of the class to close the door. But of course, the professor didn't know the name of the guy. So I simply said, the guy with the red, which is red cardinal red, can close the door, please. And so I was very impressed by how he defined the colour. I mean, that was really the right colour. So it remained in my mind. And when I thought of that, my name, I was very happy with that. So I thought that Rosso Cardinale was a good <laughs> option. Yeah, so, yeah. It's, it's a great name, I think. Thanks. It'll really stick in people's minds. Okay, tell us just a little bit more about, about your background leading up to your career as a hand knitting designer today yeah so um when i got back from um from in, from israel in italy i took a year off from everything and uh, i already knew how to knit but um my mom you know taught me about that and uh, reminded me how to do that and uh, it all happened you know i wasn't looking for it it just happened that um magazine started calling me and asking me to design something and so it's, it was like overwhelming it's uh, at the beginning having a, a different background mm -hmm. far away from fashion the first time they sent me a mood board and i had no idea what a mood board was i was supposed you know to draw something and i, I, I panicked uh, i was like oh my god how am i gonna do that i have no idea what that is um so i tried you know uh, to draw something and they took one design which was um, a brioche scarf not very easy one, it was syncopated. And um, I was very happy because my first two designs were, one was a brioche scarf and one was a yoked sweater. And um, those were my the two things that really got me into uh, knitting. You know, in Italy at that time, we didn't have many yoked sweater. Mm -hmm. So uh, I really wanted to learn to do those kind of sweaters. So knowing that one of my first design was that sweater really, you know, I was very chuffed about it. Very yeah, happy, it proud. gave you a lot of confidence. Yeah, and, and brioche, you know, that was just um, thank, something I thought. And I was very um, young at that time, what concerned in publishing. And, and, and I didn't think when I submitted that I had to write the chart for the brioche and that was like when I realized it I said okay, it's too late to you know to not to say I'm not going to do that but hey it took <laughs> a lot of time because it was a huge scarf all syncopated you know so it's like oh god how am I going to do that and so you well, were welcome to the world of, of being a hand knitting designer yeah yeah so I said okay so it takes it takes a lot of work it does yeah. it does and you've done about three collections for Pity for Latin. yes yes of course I've um, as I said uh, studying in the master that opened up a lot of uh, new doors in fashion and um, to, together with my with the university where I started with the creative knitwear design master I uh, displayed uh, two, co two uh, capsule collection and one of the, that collection was for Benetton and uh, Colors that, of Benetton yeah. yeah yeah United Color of Benetton Colors of Benetton and eventually that collaboration led me to work in their uh, office in the knitwear department for several time 
And um, so, you know, working, uh, switching from knitting, uh, hand knitting to the industrial world, it was extremely important. And that's also something that I learned during my master that was like uh, adding something to my knitting. You know, you Mm -hmm. have an idea and you can see the world from another perspective. Mm. And that's um, that was really useful and cool because, you know, you have a well-rounded idea of what you're Absolutely. doing. Absolutely. So yeah. working in um, a, a fashion, in, in the fashion world, in an eating department of a huge brand, it's always something that gives you more and from which you can learn a lot of things. And so I'm really, really uh, happy about that experience and so bringing it with me. So how did you get into embroidery and come to use it on your hand knitting designs? Yeah, so embroidery is um, it's something I knew I was doing at home, but, you know, it's something that I've always thought, maybe because my mum was telling me that, that it uh, you need to have some sort of background, you know, to know because it's very technical. So when I was studying in my master, uh, there was a, um, another friend of mine, a colleague of mine, that she was studying with me. She was from India and she was really good at everything actually because she was very patient but she was so skilled in with embroidery she was really taking her time and doing these incredible designs and I was rather jealous about that because you know I wanted to do that because she was in many colors but I was so scared because it it, it looked so difficult so incredibly complicated intimidating intimidating yeah so um it took me a while, you know, so I started to to work on it, to study a little bit more about embroidery at reading books. And um, and at a certain point, I, I'll confess, I also had a moment when I thought, do I want to be a knitter or an embroiderer? You know, because I was like, <laughs> sort of, my mind was shifting you know, to, towards embroidery. And uh, but then I realized, and I'm really glad about that, that I wanted to take the whole package, the whole embroidery package and bring it into knitwear. I'm so glad you did. Exactly. <laughs> because I really like knitting. So yeah. uh, I wanted to combine the two. Yeah. And I think it worked just fine. I mean, I'm, I'm quite happy about, about the result. Yes. You so, bring a tremendous amount to the knitting world. So I'm so thrilled that you took that decision. Thank you. But as you became a better embroiderer, how did your use of embroidery on knitwear change? Yeah. So I started uh, by working very you know it's more uh, studying the stitches individual stitches because mm-hmm. most of the time embroidery it's like using many individual stitches mm-hmm. single uh, stitches and then you know blend them together uh, put them together connect them okay yeah. so i've got here a couple of, of design um so these are the first stitches that i was doing it they look complicated and this is one thing of embroidery it always looks more complicated than what it yeah, but that's is. brilliant because yeah. you can show off. Yeah, it's yeah, a really it's, big oh, yeah. bang for your back. <laughs> oh yeah, oh yeah, I can sh- I can definitely show off. Yeah, so it it it's it's uh, these are very simple stitches. Okay, beside the okay the three D flower, it's something that came after. It takes a little bit more energy, but it's those are very easy stitches. So I've started with this kind of stitches, and mm-hmm. actually this is a French knot, and mm-hmm. it was and it is my favorite. Okay. Very basic one, but it looks good everywhere you put it. I yeah. will say that. And the, just very quickly, the others are satin stitch, is that right? No, these are, these are, these are chain, yeah, detached okay. chain stitch, yes, yeah. and there's a satin stitch, and uh, yeah, basically this is yeah. a very okay. easy one, and uh, this is slightly more complicated because we've got boolean stitch, uh-huh. now boolean stitch. That's my favourite. Uh, mine too, but people is always like, oh God, boolean stitch, because, you know, you have to know how to do it, yeah. there are some positions that you need to keep in order to have it right. Um, and uh, this is a chain stitch with a back stitch in, inside. So uh-huh. I'm not s- such a fan of chain stitch. Right. I confess. So okay. I, I I always try to put something on top of it to you know to hide the, it. Yeah, to hide <laughs> it. But and it looks very nice. And this is what I was saying. And embroidery, yeah. it's cool because you know back stitch, which is probably the most basic stitch that mm-hmm. somebody can do, mm-hmm. and a chain stitch. Okay. So, but if you put them together, you can have a lot of different You have effects. to rename the, the stitch now. I, 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 he does exist. It does exist, oh. but uh, they have no name. Usually, I thought it was like a whipped back stitch okay. or whipped uh, chain stitch, uh-huh. but it's not. Okay. So, um, yeah, so that's what I like to do, you know, mixing the two together. So this is a back stitch, for example, and it's a whipped back stitch because you, there is a, um, a thread running through it uh, and it goes under each mm. stitch so mm-hmm. it's really cool to do these kind of things and um, so this is what I, I like to do at the beginning so as you can see this looks complicated but if you 
look at it mm, and break it carefully. down yeah, into and break it bits. down exactly those are two flowers two flowers two flowers so it's it's easy yeah okay, okay. To, to understand that and uh, this is um, another swatch that i did and this was very good for me to understand because for example if we put these two together mm -hmm. you see the difference between the kind of yarn i use so this is hairy yarn mm -hmm. so you have a very fluffy effect mm. but they're not detailed it, mm. it's not there is not much definition so you can see this is a boolean yes. stitch and this is a boolean yes. stitch this looks like a fluffy thing and yeah. this you can really see the embroidery stitch totally it. Yes. so it really depends you know on uh, what effect exactly, you exactly exactly yeah. so that's why i was trying to use different yeah. yarn because yeah. the, the more you try the more you get the idea of what you want to do yeah really quickly i know this is 3d yes is this hard not really it looks complicated and yeah. it's and when i do my work so it's a little bit you know, uh, hard to explain to people because yeah. they don't see how it's made. Yes. But it's really, really easy. It's yeah. all, I always um, use this analogy of being a jazz pianist. Like once you know your scales and arpeggios, you can improvise. Yeah, exactly. And people think exactly. it's magic, but you're just doing different patterns of scales yeah, and exactly. arpeggios. So this is just different stitches and it, it looks magical. Sorry to break the magic. <laughs> yeah. But once you know the patterns, yeah. it's much easier. Yeah, because like you, you know how to yeah. do that. So you can move around more easily. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah, it's like that. Okay. So, so after so, the, uh, yeah. after studying those stitches, I, you know, um, decided to do something more, um, I wouldn't say complicated because I wasn't looking for complex things. Mm -hmm. I was just looking for drawing, you know, with, mm -hmm. uh, with embroidery. So I came up with this other kind of technique with this more uh, like picture embroidery where you take a picture and you sort of have to do it and um, to replicate with yarn and your needle. So um, the stitches are basically few, but, you know, it takes some other uh, things. The kinds of materials that you might mix, you've, you can have very thin, um, shiny wool and fluffy wool. Uh, do you also use silk and cotton in amongst your wool? I try not to. Okay. I'm, 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 you know, I try, I always say that I prefer to use wool on wool mm. and not to use cotton on wool. You know, without going too much in detail, I would just tell you that cotton is much heavier yes. than wool. Okay, so you do not want your front of the sweater to be extremely heavy or bagging yeah, exactly yeah. and a bag to come up because yeah. the front is too heavy yeah. so uh, i would stick to to yeah. wool when i when i embroider on wool however there are some exceptions that i can say like for example very very, very easy if you embroider a dog and you want to make the nose like the, that wet effect yes. know, you can use some the white you can make to light you can use the cotton yeah so with some white you can make a little, yeah. little triangle and that because it's shiny or for yeah. example the eye you know yes. eye is, is made of a watery material yeah so the watery effect you can um with some silk or something yeah shiny. you can make yeah. it yeah because it's more shiny and it's uh, all around it there's wool so it's going to shine even more and that gives you a depth uh that it's really so you're cool. really thinking like a painter yeah i do yeah well that is uh it's like painting yeah. painting with yarn absolutely finally and recently i've been um I've been using embroidery, I, you, know, I, you know, I came across this black work embroidery while studying and I was, um, I thought they're crazy. I mean, people who do this kind of embroidery must be crazy because you, when you do it on canvas, it's really counted embroidery. So it takes like forever. And, um, but the effect, it's so beautiful. It is. I was like, oh my God, I have to do something because now we see sample shapes, but they really embroider uh, animals and huge things and they create all different effects by using more strands while embroidering together like we can see here they uh, I used a different uh, amount of strands so here uh, the three two and one and mm -hmm. breaking it breaking the pattern mm -hmm. in, in pieces so and it sort of it gives that effect of uh, shading and it's just beautiful. And if you think about a shape and you want to give it a 3D effect and use this kind of uh, shading, it's unbelievable from my point of view. It's just like, wow, I can't, it I can't is believe stunning. it. And it's even more stunning just in the black and white, isn't it? Yes, yes, exactly. They do it also white and white. Okay. White, uh, white work embroidery, but mm, I, I really like the black. Yeah. You know, it's very elegant. And uh, and so uh, working with that, I usually do something very challenging. When I, w when I really like something and I want to... Uh, which is something a little bit crazy also. Um, when I want to be sure I manage to work with that technique, yeah. I, um, I 
try to make um, a design, a real design, not only a sample, yeah. but a design with a deadline, with, with a magazine. So you know that it has to be good. I mean, you yeah. cannot, so you, you have to learn it. So I've, I've done this, yeah, yeah. Um, th th this design and I wanted to incorporate this black work in it and, and on the sleeves and on, uh, and on the bottom part of the front. And on the back also. Yes, just to show the viewers very quickly. So, and, I, and I tried to create that effect of shading using different strands of yarn. And um, I, I, was very, I was very pleased with it. I mean, it's very simple. But it's, it's utterly stunning. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 like, you know, I like to add um, just a detail to something that makes, it, that makes a difference. And, um, and there is also another um, good uh, aspect of it. I mean, if you, if you see this kind of publication, you might say, I'm not going to do the embroidery because it's, I'm not able to. Well, okay, you still have a pattern of, of a sweater a and you yes. can use, use it for whatever. You can use Intarsha on it. You can yeah. do whatever pattern you want. Yeah. So, you know, there is this two, uh, two upside that are good to use to, to think about it when you see this kind of, of designs. I love the way that when you're passionate about a new technique, you try to go immediately to the most intense part of that technique and understand it. Yes, yes. That's what you were saying by making yourself do it on a design yes. with a deadline. And yeah, yeah, because you know you have you when you have a deadline when it's for somebody, you have a sort of responsibility. You feel it. Mm -hmm. So um, it you also have it... to break it down and explain it in a way. Yeah, that exactly, people... exactly. Because there's a pattern to do it. So mm -hmm. you know, and uh, but that helps you because if you know that you have to do that, or at least if I know that I have to do it. Um, you go through it in a certain way and, yes. and that helps you throughout your life, I think, because yeah. you, once you, you Very have Very thorough. Okay, so let's move on to your aesthetic. Yep. You're best known for using detailed embroidery, as we've just seen, followed by a preference for colour work. Yep. So how would you describe your style and what um, themes do you gravitate towards when designing? So uh, when I think about my designs, you know, I really like going around and looking around. For me, it's very important. So um, I try to look at buildings, geometries, architecture, and I'm making my own. So I, I just, you know, collect images and keep it for myself so that my inspiration uh, comes up and I can think about it later. Mm -hmm. So it's all, a, mm -hmm. it's all a collection. And I really like also, you know, traveling a lot. Mm -hmm. So um, when I travel, I try to catch glimpses of different things. Uh, and uh, I've been to Japan several times, for example. And one thing that I love about the, the style is that they have very basic, plain garments. Mm -hmm. And then they put something very small, which is a detail that makes it special. I mean, something that you would look at it. I mean, it's not a sweater, plain sweater that you wouldn't notice. Yeah. It's a sweater that has something and you say, wow, so, and, and you look at it. So um, also in Japan, uh, architecture, and it's, it's very important. It's something that really gives me a lot. And for example, when I, when I say ge uh, that geometric shape are like things that I like to look at, this is one of my latest design and uh, it's really, uh, it's really geometric. Okay. And very colorful. So I try to put colors and, you know, geometric uh, uh, shapes in it. And this is all in Tasha. Yes, this is all all in Tasha. It took some time to do it, but it was fun. Okay, and um, and this is another design that I have, and it's a yoked sweater, mm -hmm. uh, and you can see that also here we have very geometric yeah. shapes. So, yeah. uh, this is how I like to play with ge with uh, geometric shapes. Yeah, that's gorgeous. Yeah. Okay, so eventually you like to put intarsia yeah. and embroidery together but they are two techniques that some knitters would consider fairly difficult so talk to us more about why it's a good idea what the advantages are to combine them but also what the challenges are for yeah. the knitter. First of all yeah they are considered com a little bit complete, uh, complete, uh, um, complicated. complex yeah, complicated <laughs> that was the word but uh, you know however if you if you decide to add embroidery on it intarsia is going to be easier because you you have to work with less color but you still have embroidery to do on it so um i think that it's really good because you can make a very detailed uh design because you know embroidery gives you the possibility to add details that uh, otherwise it wouldn't too be too difficult to yeah. yes they, yeah. they would be too small but, um but however it's it's complicated now just to give you an example when you do a sweater or any kind of project and you have to um, create the uh the pattern for the entire shot then you have to uh, print out to draw and to print out 
the design you want to embroider on top of it, you need to, to print it the correct size. Mm. And the correct size, it's not always easy to find. Then you have to trace it on the tracing paper, which is not going to be transparent, so or not totally transparent. So you will have to put it on top of the sweater and be sure that you placed it the, the right way and in the right position. And then you will have to secure everything with a hook and you know securing wool it's not always so easy so for for example i i brought here this design and this was a huge embroidery that i made on top of a intarsha um the intarsha here was fairly easy because mm -hmm. it, it was just it just divides the sweater in two colors but um i had to plant that the, the eagle to be big enough to cover the line mm -hmm. and uh, uh the main the, the hardest time was to print out this design because it, it doesn't fit in one A4 paper nor in two. So I had to, to print it out in four A paper, ah, in, in A, yes. four A4 paper yeah. and put them on top of it and then to draw everything and use the hoop and move it around and the fabric is getting very, very thick. So when you move the hoop, you have that problem of securing everything and being able that everything is secure. So what I usually do for this kind of, uh, of design is beginning from the center, which mm -hmm. in this case, it's all work in satin stitch. And that will sort of keep the tracing paper quite firm. Yes. Okay, so it will, it, it, it will give you the first um, sector uh, and it will keep it in place so that all the, the other things you go into embroider around, they're gonna yeah. be good. Before but, we take it off, I just want to point out, I love the way it actually looks like feathers. Yeah, so well, this is a um, a technique that it's it's often used for this kind of of embroidery, which was the embroidery that I was calling the picture embroidery, and uh, there are several things that are very important to take into consideration. But one of those is um, the direction of the stitches. Okay, mm -hmm. if you want to do something, if you want to embroider something, and you want it to look uh, like uh, in real life, you have to first of all look. At, in this case, the eagle in real life. So, mm -hmm. so study that in depth and uh, um, understand the direction that the feather would have in real life. And uh, um, the advice that I always give to my student is to uh, sort of draw lines while you do the embroidery, before doing the embroidery, uh, in order to be able to keep that, that direction yes. because otherwise you are going to mess it up. Yes. Definitely. So uh, it's not going to work. It's going to look it's not going to look nice so yeah it requires a lot of planning ahead that is and that, that is the main thing but for me it's always better to plan ahead so you don't have to undo anything yes. than not planning because you are rushing or because maybe you can't be bothered <laughs> yeah or or you are just very eager you know yeah, to, to yeah, avoid yeah. it so you just say okay like when when needs to do not make the swatch you know? yes uh and then you have to start again anyway so mm. from planning ahead is a boring thing but it's mm. the most important mm. part about the eye, this is, for example, this white part is made with cotton and that whatever what I was talking before, if you, if you embroider um, AI, it's very important to give that light in order yeah. to, to, to create some depth. And in this case, I used uh, some, some, some cotton. And I like this stitch is very flat here in contrast to this kind of feathery. Yeah, and, and there is also a technique, if I can mention about this technique, to in, in order to maintain the correct angle, yes. because the, it's very tricky. It, it is, it's, uh, I mean, it seems very, super easy to make something, uh, cir uh, you know, to embroider a circle, yeah. but it's not. It, it, what I usually suggest to do is, if you think it as a clock, okay, uh -huh. you, you yes. begin by nine, six and three yes. and then you divide those yes. sector even more and you continue divide them because the smaller the, um, the space the easier to maintain the correct Exa angle exactly. yeah because if you begin one if you begin stitching one next to, to each other yeah. eventually you will proceed like this yes. you will not manage to keep this yes. angle so it's very complicated what i do is proceeding like a clock excellent it, tip yeah it makes it so easy so this is for this design, but I've done another one, yeah. which is here. We have it here. Just going to quickly show it up like this. It's so stunning. <laughs> it, took, it, it took a couple of, uh, no, not about, a week, almost a week. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, great. And we have this second, um, the second design, which is my Panthera uh, sweater. So here I use several technique, but... The, the, you know, the most uh, complicated part was the intarsia because the, the Pantera here is worked with intarsia. So after that, I had to 
collect to print out the face and try the correct size so I had to print it like 100 pages in order to understand which was the correct size then place it on top and beginning embroidery and I'll confess I was a little bit afraid because you don't really realize if everything is it's in, in the correct place while you do it so you know you you have to have some experience and also here you have to plan in advance because for example this in Tasha if it, no we can't see under <laughs> not because there's the embroidery no it's because you, yeah, you don't yeah. see but the embroidery is cut it's yes. made like this yes. because I didn't need to to do any shaping of uh, to, to to give it any shape yeah. because I knew that here there was a flower so yes. I simply did like this and okay. then I drew a, uh, I drew the flower so. that is what you have to plan in a, plan ahead, okay, so that you can work the uh, the intarsia. Uh, uh, like here, it's a reverse uh, stocking stitch. Here, uh, it's stocking stitch, and uh, but here it stops here. Okay. Because I knew that I you wanted didn't to need put, it. Yeah. yeah, and you don't want double thickness. Exactly. So yeah. it's like yeah. I'm gonna put it there, and uh, but you need to you know plan in advance. Yeah. Otherwise, you cannot do that. So here I used mm, several stitches like satin stitch. Here it's the same Technique, idea. Yes, yeah, yes, with idea this of the um, eyes. shimmery kind exactly. of multiple, multiple colors. So here are the edges that, of course, are not made like like this. These are the small details that I was talking about. Yeah. I mean, making this kind of uh, jagged. I think it said uh, yes. effect. Uh, you cannot. You can do it with with, with intarsia, but it's it's more complicated. Yes. And with embroidery, you can just embroider with a black yarn, and you will get it. Yes. So it's it's much easier. And this is um um like herringbone stitch, and it's very uh, embroidery stitch, mm -hmm. proper embroidery stitch. So I I also decided to use it on for for this design. And these these are all French knots, and you know I I, I use several techniques, and but the mm, the most difficult part was, you know, to uh, to place it. Yeah, to, to place it because you have to print it, you have to place the, the the you have to trace it on the tracing paper, and then put it on top of it, and you don't often see. I can see that. Use. Now, do you ever um, decide between two stitches because you know that one will be more wearable? Yeah, for me. You know, embroidery on a garment is extremely important to that people who has it, who, who wears it, are not afraid of going around. You yeah. know, it's the same concept of floats when you have, when you do color work. Yes. Um, so I try not to make uh, too uh, long stitches. Like, for for example, these stitches are borderline. I mean, okay. not yeah. more than that. Because yeah. otherwise, you know, if you have a ring, if you have a bracelet, a watch, you could just... Yeah. You know, ruin it so these are um, tops not more than that yeah yeah and uh, also on the back yes. on the back it's real oh, that's gorgeous too yeah this is real oh. intarsia so I made the, the flower in intarsia and I can assure you that before the embroidery I was like ooh <laughs> <laughs> there, there I mean I couldn't really see it and um, but so let, let me ask you something. Yeah. Did you have to do any, anything extra? Like, do you no. find yourself modifying it as you go along or you pretty pretty yeah. much stick to your yeah, plan? Yeah, pretty much. So embroidery is, I always say to my student, uh, you trace something and then feel free to... Um, Embellish. Just, yeah, to yeah. go another road, to take another road. But... Uh, in this case, uh, I try not to because it's very big because yeah. it's uh, it's uh, it was planned to be a sweater, so you know. But uh, maybe I wasn't planning to use chain stitch in this yeah. way. Yeah. Now that that. But that uh, is so great. Yeah, and, and this is textures. the only way that I like um, chain stitch because I said before I don't like it. Yeah. But as a filling stitch, it's it's gorgeous. I mean, I love it. It looks like you've actually knitted it. Yeah. You know, that's that's amazing. That's great. And so I love beautiful. the way you've got it around like that. Imagine doing that from knitting. Yeah. That, that's no, just that's, yeah, that's difficult. why I also decided to, I was very lucky because I had planned to make the, the flower in a re reverse stock and stitch yeah. so that you can get that uh, difference. So, yeah, uh, I was very pleased with the design. So just very quickly, when you have your hoop, roughly how big is your hoop and, yeah. and how often are you moving it? So um, when I uh, have my hoop, I usually, as I said before, for the um, for the um, for for the design, I try to put it and work uh, a a big part of the embroidery in order that that's gonna help me keep the paper in in the right place. So I I create uh, I I embroider all this part, for example, and then I move. Yes. Here is the tricky part because you know insert is uh, securing a wall with the embroidery on a hoop which is not made to embroider on wool, uh, 
it's a little bit complicated because here it's going to be very thick. Mm-hmm. So it's going to come out. I, I, I try to use big hoops. Mm-hmm. So one and, and two or one and two. Mm-hmm. And uh, the cool thing is that once you have these two parts, you could embroider this without a hoop because um, it's everything is firm enough. Mm-hmm. So once you have worked these two parts and you can use a small hoop for this one, then these parts you could try to embroider without a hoop if you can't fit it. So you've been teaching embroidery workshops during the Swiss Yarn Festival. Yep. And apart from teaching the different uh, stitches, what other skills and knowledge do you like to pass on to your students so that they create really beautiful embroidery? So uh, during my workshop, um, I give to my student a template. Okay, So for example, this is the drawing that they get. And uh, they all have a tracing paper. Okay, there are several types. This is my favorite. You, they, you have to, you take just a piece, you place it on top of the drawing. It's not transparent, but definitely transparent enough to yes. be able to trace the drawing. Yeah. So they trace the drawing with, with a marker. And then what happens is that they take a hoop, they put the hoop without the screw underneath, they put a swatch and then they, they, they secure everything uh, everything with a second ring, basically the one with the screw, and they okay. close it in order to secure everything. Okay. At the end of the embroidery, whatever they have is like this. Now, this is just a sample that is still that is not finished, of course, but this is the tracing paper, this is the, the, the swatch, and everything is kept together by the embroidery, okay? What they do is they cut off the extra pieces, then um, they put everything under running water just to get rid of the the extra pieces which are right in, in the middle. Uh, and that dissolves? Yeah, and it dissolves with water because it needs to be water-soluble. And uh, then they you know, top off, uh, they use some water into a basin and they put the embroidery like this in order to allow, you know, the tracing paper to um, go to the bottom and to melt completely. And okay. then you can dry it in here okay. and, and you have the, the embroidery on, uh, on your swatch or on your, sw- or on your sweater. Yeah. So uh, this is, for example, another, uh, another design and this is quite a basic one because it's a great exercise once you learned these basic stitches. These are very, they look complicated because there are many colors, but um, they're, they're quite easy. So uh, the, the thing that they can use this design for is learning to place the, embroider and the embroidery and, you know, to connect the different flowers with branches because I know that some people might be a little bit afraid when they have a blank uh, surface here mm-hmm. and they have to fill it say where am I going to start off from mm-hmm. but they simply put some flowers here and there and then they can connect and as I said um, the French knot which is my favorite wherever you put it it's going to look good okay <laughs> so if you have a an empty space just put a French knot and it's going to work just fine so even for something like this which is fairly evenly spread around would you advise to start at the center and work outwards so the, the pattern of this one is made of two, of two A4 uh-huh. uh, paper. So um, in this case, it's not so um, relevant. But what I would do is start by uh, embroidering the branches. So the uh, branches will yeah. hold everything down. Yes. So then you can add uh, flowers when you get bored. You stop, you come the following day and you can embroider new flowers. So yeah, so th- yeah. it's it's really good idea to to proceed like that in my opinion. I see that because then you know that it's evenly spread around with the branches. And moreover, yeah. you know, sometimes it happens that you have a flower on top of a, a, a of a leaf. So you want to have the le- the um, the leaf or sorry you have um, a flower on top of a branch yes. or or uh, yeah or also a flower on top of a of a leaf so you want to have the leaf and branches made before so that you can go on top of it without having any problem because it gets a little bit tricky yes. to embody something that it's supposed to go under yes. okay yes. <laughs> uh, so that's yeah. utterly gorgeous is this mayak yes this is mayak yarn yes absolutely yeah. okay Okay, and what have we got here? And, uh, well, this is a nice kind of embroidery. This is still the embroidery that, that, that I was talking about before, which is the picture embroidery. Mm-hmm. And because one of the um, main things that I try to pass on to my student, which for me, it's a rule in life, it's not only, it's not to learn a stitch, but it's to understand the stitch. It's, mm. it's, it's a subtle difference. Mm. Okay? But, you know, when you learn something, most of the people learn how to do this thing here on this swatch and then you give them another swatch and, and, and they... They can't know, transfer yeah, that knowledge. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But if they understand how to do something... 
they can move around on whatever need they have. Okay, so for example, here it's this is something that I try because I wanted to try the stitches, and uh, here we have um, the four colors that blend together, and um, this is one of the technique I've been teaching in my workshop. So we, we have the black, the dark blue, and different shades of blue. Um, and there is a, a lot of technique in order to be able to blend them together. And uh, those are the stitches that I've been teaching, basically. And for this kind of technique, you only need three, four stitches, not more than that. So uh, a relevant question would be, well, for four stitches, a three-hour workshop, well, that's a lot. Well, no, because that is you know, just a blending of color. But for example, here we have a black line. Mm -hmm. And that black line, it's really important because if people just embroider without observing where they are meant to, um, to embroider, they end up with something very flat. Mm -hmm. And that lines tell us, even though we do not realize, that there is a shadow underneath. Yeah. So this uh, part is... is, is, is it's further is, forward. Exactly, that, from this one. This is really important for this kind of embroidery mm -hmm. because otherwise you get everything very flat. Mm -hmm. So um, it, it's true that drawing and blending, it's only three or four stitches, but if you don't understand where to use it and you don't understand how to look at things mm -hmm. and, um, you know, all, you know, the 3D um, idea of of stuff that you're going to uh, embroider, they're not enough. Yeah. Like, so you need to learn uh, and to understand. The, so you're, in a sense, teaching people to not just look and see, oh, that's a bird and there's its wing, but to look at it as if they don't even know what it is and just look exactly what is there. Yeah, absolutely. And then, then you have they, to observe, to yeah. observe things. You have to pay, t take your time yeah. and observe things because, after all, these are all the same stitches. So mm. you're going to continue to do the same yeah. Stitch over and over again. Yeah. The thing is. And you've got similar kinds of things yeah, in this exactly, poppy. Exactly. So here I have used different kind of red, different shades of red, because in this kind of embroidery, it's very important. It's not, a, it's not that you blend two colors. Uh, it's two different, different colors. Yeah, yeah, two different shades of the same color. Yeah. So dark blue and it goes uh, uh, and from uh, light blue and a dark blue, mm -hmm. you need to go through several shades of blue mm -hmm. in order to have a very smooth transit. Mm -hmm. So here's the same. I use different kind of red. And because, you know, poppy are flowers that tend to be very delicate and the petal, you can see light through. Mm -hmm. So they're sort of transparent. So it really depends on where the light strikes the object. Mm -hmm. So if there is light that strikes an object, it's going to be like, for example, two leaves. Mm -hmm. you, if you have two leaves, one on top of the other, one will be bright green. Yes. And, and the one that is, that, that is under cannot have the same color yes. because the light will not stroke that yes. leaf the same way. So this is a concept that it's very important. And I also try to to, to use it here um, using different kinds yeah. of reds. And I can also see just the direction of these stitches as well also adds to the effect yeah. of if something is slightly more transparent or more 3D. Absolutely, I can yeah, see that. that's yeah. true. Yeah. That's great. And what about on this one? This is sort yeah. of similar, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. This is the same thing, same stitches, same concept about the direction of the leaf, same transit. We're still talking about blue. And uh, here the part which would be underneath the um, the wing is, is is darker. Why? Because, of course, the light will hit here, but will not hit underneath the, the wing. So it's important to give this kind of things. Otherwise, you end up not understanding where something ends and something begins. This is really important. Yeah, I can see that. Okay, now, just getting back to practical things, uh, we'll show this design here. This is This has got, whoops, that's yep. the back. Um, but this is a design that's knitted in the round and it's got this beautiful embroidery on it. So practically, how do you go about doing this? Well, so there are two ways. If you knit flat, so in pieces, it's a lot easier because you basically will end up having only, I mean, if you want to embroider only the front, you have the piece of the front, so it's easier. If you are knitting in the round, it might be a little bit more complicated. So what I do usually is if I want to place um, the embroidery on the yoke, like in this case, I knit the yoke, I stop, I begin with the embroidery, 
and then I continue with the body and the sleeves. Okay. Or the sleeves and the body. So this is knitted top down. Yes. This and is once top you've down. knitted to about here, yeah, you I, stop, and then you don't have a whole lot of material. Exactly, flapping around. because because you know when you do embroidery, usually this is a, a, another nice concept. This is my swatch. For example, I I put my needle here. I leave the needle. I take it from under. I pull and then I do the other way around. Mm. There is no this kind of cheating mm. thing. Okay? Yeah, yeah. So, um, so every stitch is... Exactly, it's up and down. So yeah. when you work on, um, on a sweater which is already done, mm. like this one, you only have this yes. opening and this opening yes. and a lot of material around, it gets very frustrating. Absolutely, I can see very that. Very frustrating. Okay, that's and, really, yeah. yeah. That's cool. And what design is this? Is this also... This is also for my yak. Yeah. Yes, my yak yarn. I yeah. saw the yarn. And since you show, showed it back, yeah. it gives me the, the chance to say this. It's not that I was lazy and I didn't <laughs> want to, to, to do the back. It's just that embroidery, I want, as we, we were saying before, I want to make things wearable. Yes. Okay, so you don't have control on what's happening on yeah. your back. You might sit somewhere and then move and it rip everything off. So here, at least you know what's going on. Very good. On the back, it might be a little bit complicated. You want to be able to relax. And... Exactly, without <laughs> being afraid of having something yeah. ripping off your embroidery. Okay, that is so wonderful. And I can see the shading here. That is that they separate lines or is that variegated? No, this is... Uh, the, All uh, separate, uh, the, yeah. Yeah, this is the, the yarn, actually. Oh, that's a, oh, it's a variegated, yes, yeah. Yes, okay. yes, yes, yes. That's great. So uh, this was just um, a sample... I wanted to try new stitches and to try the cotton. So, mm -hmm. as I said before, I wouldn't like... Normally use yeah, cotton. Yeah, this is very yeah. heavy. Yes. So, um, but these are all stitches tried to, to use different yarn. So, I wanted to see the difference between, like, mm, fluffy yarn and uh, uh, cotton yarn. Yeah. Just so you can see that it's very shiny. Yeah, okay. So, we'll end the interview just with two more quick questions. Okay. First of all, what do you know about your demographics? So, who is knitting your designs? And also, what criteria do you have in mind when you're designing for men? So, um, about my design, I don't have much uh, feedback because um, I mainly work for magazines. I have a pattern on Ravelry, but I mainly work for, for magazines. So, people just buy the magazine and... Uh, and you don't uh, really well, know who's yeah, doing it. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I don't have a feedback. Um, about my, my sweater... Um, I like men sweaters, even though I I uh, knitted a lot of women pieces. I like men sweater because all in all, sometimes I would like to wear them. So, mm -hmm. uh, uh, and um, I don't like. Um, I mean, I like to create either something um, very spectacular, like the eagle sweater, mm -hmm. something that oh. it's really cool, but I wouldn't wear. Mm -hmm. Okay, and something uh, more classic. Um, very casual but still classic that I can wear but I always like to add some kind of um, touch like the Japanese yeah in order influence. to make it wearable also to go to clubs you know I don't want that kind of very classic image of um, some, boring old yeah, man <laughs> exactly I want I want a sweater that can go and use the sweater that feels cool yeah. to go to school to, statement. to to go to club yes I really like that kind of thing so yeah. I think it embroidery works well for for expressing this kind of concept certainly in the clubs with the because the shine yes yeah. <laughs> yes I should do uh, an entire sweater like yeah. this also yeah <laughs> and this is one of your favorite ones yes this is my favorite yes yeah, one of my favorite absolutely it's gorgeous yes it has been such a treat to have you on Fruity Knitting thank you so much I am so thrilled that you exist <laughs> with your knowledge because you've added just a whole new world to, to to knitting and I love it when there's a crossover between two crafts and you do it with such intensity and, and such beauty so thank you so much yeah, thank you so much for having me it was amazing good let's say goodbye to the audience bye bye cheers